Yeah. Yep. Can you hear us? <laughs> okay, now. Oh, oh, it works. Okay. <laughs> well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julio Carcamo. I have the privilege of heading the Social and Environmental Monitoring Office of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, CABEI. Welcome to this event, which focuses on financing women in micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises for a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery in the Central American region. A joint effort between the Taiwan International Cooperation Development Fund, ICDF, and the Central American Bank for Economic Integration. The economies and societies of the Central American region have, have been disrupted, not only by the pandemic, but also by the latest clim climate change events. The impacts have been more visible and disproportionate on women and their communities. Women are facing not only inequalities, but also financial and non-financial barriers. These barriers have been present and now have been worsened with the effects of climate change. This event, offers the opportunity to hear leaders from the region and Taiwan to discuss how innovative financial mechanisms can assist the transformation, especially for women-owned, led business recoveries after COVID-19. In addition, to react to the climate emergency. It will also cover how financial institutions can encourage women entrepreneurs to a start of shift into green, and resilient climate-related business, and how gender equality in the boardroom and a more influential role of women can be reached. Finally, I would like to add that CABEI, Taiwan ICDF, and Taiwan Ministry of Foreign Affairs are working together to develop innovative financial solutions for women financial inclusion. With this introduction, it is my pleasure to present the panelists in the event. First, we will, we will hear from Mr. Alex, L.J. Chi, who will give us opening remarks, and then we will hear from our four distinguished panelists. Mr. Alex L.J. Chi is ICDF's Deputy Secretary General. He holds an MBA as well as financial management studies. His experience is vast within the Taiwanese development cooperation as well as in several countries and regions. Thanks for your words, Mr. Alex. Thank you. Moderator uh, Julia Kakamo, <laughs> Mr. Miguel Mendez, Ms. Sophia Chen, and Mr. Jonathan Yu. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Taiwan ICDF, it is a pleasure for me to address today's event. Uh, firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to Kabei for co organizing this event with the Taiwan ICDF to discuss how to deliver a gender-focused recovery in Central America. We will present our actions for assisting women and women-owned business in the region to recover after the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as to react to the increasing climate impacts. The COVID-19 pandemic has been significantly disrupting economics and the societies throughout the world, including Central America. Micro, small, and medium enterprises across the region are suffering harsh impacts. Moreover, extreme climate events such as Hurricane Ita and Iota have exacerbated economic damages caused by the pandemic. Gender economic inequality has widened during COVID-19 and uh, worsened with climate change. Women are suffered higher unemployment rates than men since they are um, overrepresented in informal sectors, of which many are climate sensitive and COVID 19 sensitive, such as tourism. In addition, women constitute a large share of micro and small enterprises' ownership 
and encounter great difficulties than men in accessing knowledge and skills, and thus credit and financial services. Economical measures will not lead to effective recovery without consideration of impact of women and the integration of gender perspectives into solutions. This is why we are here today, to discuss how innovative financial mechanisms can effectively help the transformation of Central America, in particular for women and women-owned enterprises to recover post-19. COVID-19 and uh, response to climate change. We are delighted to have experts from financial institutions, Ms. Ms. Sophia Chen, Chief Investment Officer from Taiwan's Casey Financial Holdings, and uh, Ms. Uh, Mara Flack, President of Bank Provi of Honduras, to join us, oh, yes, and uh, experts yeah. from development organization Kabei and the Taiwan HDF. They will share their experience and insight and practice to lay a ground for a green, resilient, and inclusive recovery in the region. Taiwan has a long-standing relationship with Kabei and Central America to support our partner countries in the region in boosting the economic. And after pandemic, the Taiwan ICDF prioritized its focus on increasing women's economic empowerment. We will collaborate with Kabei on providing financial services and combining concessional loans and credit guarantees to help women increase access to financing and promote women's partnership in the sectors driving economic recovery. The world is still in the middle of fighting the pandemic as well as <coughs> climate change. As a responsible member of the international community, Taiwan is committed to assisting our allies and the friendly countries to overcome the crisis. The Taiwan ICDF will continue to work together with our partners to help people in the need if we firmly believe no one should be left behind. Together, we can put the world on a path to green, resilient, and inclusive development. In closing, I look forward to the great success of the event and wish every one of you good health. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Alex. Now we will hear from Mr. Jonathan Liu. Mr. Liu is ICDF Director of the Lending and Investment Department. He holds an MS in International Business his experience includes several technical and financial positions within ICDF. His presentation will cover the challenge of COVID-19 in Latin America and the Caribbean, examples of inclusive involvement post-COVID-19, mm -hmm. and the very important issue of partnerships. Thank you, Mr. Jonathan, for your words. Thank you, moderator, for your kind introductions. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jonathan Liu. I coming from Taiwan ICDF, uh, Taiwan International Corporation and the Development Fund. Uh, uh, it's my honor to be here. Actually, this is my first time to come to the uh, COP event. Uh, today, I'm happy to share some experience with my fr friends of Taiwan, uh, how we assist uh, women and the women lead enterprises in rebounding the economic activities through technical and financial support in this tough period. And uh, next one, please. Uh, this is my presentation outlines. First of all, I will just uh, introduce who we are and uh, followed by the challenge for COVID-19 and as well as the climate change in Central America. It's okay. Of 
course, I will uh, give you some cases how we take some innovative uh, projects we carry out in Central America. And after all, we have a partnership uh, for different uh, international organization of regional development bank. Next, please. Actually, the Taiwan ICDF is 100% government-owned and government-funded, and the largest foreign aid agency in Taiwan. And our core competence involved in providing people capital, knowledge, and the technology uh, to support the economic development and uh, enhance the human resources, as well as uh, promoting on the bilateral relationship in the developed countries. So our main objective is to support the overall uh, development of the uh, partner countries, mainly followed by four strategies we have, as you see in our slide. Firstly, we will join on our Taiwan uh, comparative advantage to overseas. And secondly, uh, we always, the, every project we carry out have to uh, be in line with uh, the country need. The second one is uh, we, are, we are trying to integrate the public and the private sector's resources together to enlarge the project impact. The last one is uh, we are uh, trying to strengthen the cooperative relationship, not only for the country, but also for the regional institutions. Next. Okay, thank you. And uh, actually, so our work is uh, tailor-made to the local needs of each developing countries. And uh, our investment covers a variety of development issues. So we select agricultural, information, communication, and technology, uh, public health, education, uh, environment, as well as the small, medium, and the enterprise uh, as our priority areas. So to uh, fulfill our uh, mandate and uh, our missions, these areas are carried out by each different instrument. And uh, as shown on the right side of the slide. Uh, the technical cooperation, humanitarian assistance, uh, international education and training, and lending and inve investment, as well as uh, research and uh, development. Next, please. So uh, currently, we have uh, 97 ongoing projects in 34 countries. And uh, actually, so we dispatched 22 uh, technical missions with around 250 expertise or professional overseas to the countries or the, to, the, to the different countries to carry out different projects. Next, please. And uh, here's the topic one. I would like to talk about uh, some cases in agricultural areas, how we take innovative measures for small farm holders to respond to the climate change. Next. So actually, uh, there are more and more indica uh, study indicate that the climate change is increasing the frequencies and the uh, severities of extreme weather. And the disaster caused by the extreme weather will continue set back the sustainable development. Especially people in the developing countries are seven times more likely to be hurt than in developed ones. So let's get back to the Central America. I will say that this region is uh, pretty high, uh, vulnerable to the weather uh, variabilities. That adversely affects everyone, every sector, and every country. And uh, actually, the economic loss of all disasters in these regions are roughly up to 2.2 trillion by 2020, and uh, rising about 2.5 times in the last 20 years. 
of which 77% uh, uh, was caused by extreme weather. Uh, that is intensified as the Earth is getting warmer. However, the challenge in the Central America are the same as we have and uh, we face in Taiwan. Uh, to some extent, that forced us to innovate a new technology to mitigate the damage come along with natural disasters such as uh, cyclones or landslides or floodings. And uh, nowadays, we are transforming this uh, ex experience into the practical project carried out uh, in Central America and to support the international uh, climate actions. Next, please. In this case, I will show you uh, actually the coffee and uh, citrus are two economic pillars in Central America. And uh, actually, that creates thousands of thousands of uh, job opportunity and uh, contributing uh, tremendous foreign exchange to the nations. And uh, roughly more than 60% of the labor force was women. Uh, unfortunately, sir, in recent years, the outbreak of COVID rust and uh, uh, side trust uh, disease that we call the Huang Long Bin, HLB, uh, in Central America has severely destroyed the region economic with huge loads of uh, uh, estimations, uh, one, one, one billion over the past few years. And this kind of outbreak, I will say, that is highly related to the climate change. And uh, uh, that also makes strong uh, economic and the social negative impact on women's livelihood. Uh, in this regard, the Taiwan ICDF pitched the ideas um, of com combining the disease, disease control uh, technology with uh, financial services to Orisa and uh, to Cabez, and quickly uh, uh, co funding these uh, two regional programs. Uh, to respond to the outbreak uh, risk. As a matter of fact, the component, the core component of the regional programs involved in, uh, involving in uh, mass productions of uh, health seedling and uh, establishing uh, systems of integrated pest management as well as uh, early warning systems uh, to prevent from the outbreak uh, risk. Actually, all the efforts and the achievement of the regional program have so far, I will say, was based on uh, the experiences and the technology uh, the Taiwan ICD have introduced in uh, Central America. That also was based on well engagement with the regional uh, good partners and the local stakeholders uh, in Central America. Next, please. In uh, this case, I will show you how we connect the fruit productions and the climate change adaptations through smart technology. And uh, we, uh, everybody know that, knows that rice, bean, and corn are major crops in Central America. However, in recent years, the supply hardly meets the demand. Uh, as the, as the, as, as the, because the, in the, we, the weather in this region is getting harder and drier. So the local farmers in these regions are always regarded as uh, affected groups most responsive to the climate extreme weather. And that is the reason why the, the farmers, they are always stay in low productions on the supply side. So recently, Taiwan ICDF co-worked with uh, International Centers for Tropical uh, Agriculture, we call the SIAT, to develop a crop management application, APP. Uh, that APP was based on the new technology of big data. GIS is the main ge uh, geographical information system, as well as uh, 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 some IoT uh, Internet of Things. Uh, light, uh, uh, actually, the light applications integrate so many information that the farmers need for plantings, uh, such as uh, crop calendars or, uh, or, or some weather forecast, as well as uh, uh, soil map, uh, pest management, 
and the others um, uh, planting advices. I think that's all information will enable the local farmers quickly to quickly to uh, response any extreme weather happened. So I'm sure that we will continue to develop a high efficiency with with low cost instrument uh, for the farmers and also stay with the farmers to improve agricultural resilience and transformation in Central America. Next, please. Uh, second part, I will uh, uh, present to you how we get involved in uh, inclusive programs for women and for women lead in Central America, particularly in the, this uh, post-COVID-19 era. Next, please. Uh, I will say if the climate change is a chronic disease, then the COVID-19 is an acute disease that global is facing at this moment. So according to the International Labor Organi Organization's estimated light, uh, the pandemic will cost 180 million women living in poverty in these regions. The economic recessions primarily affects informal workers who lost their job almost immediately. And uh, that reflects the, the rate of the unemployment rate for females uh, in this region is high up to 22% by 2020. In terms of uh, business sectors, 76% uh, 76 of, uh, uh, of women and women-led enterprises, uh, actually they, they, they hardly to get a, a financial facility in the market. It's the, the financial institution took more strict credit policies under such adverse circumstances. Uh, so in order to mitigate uh, the uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on disadvantaged groups in Central America, the Taiwan ICDF is going to initiate a holistic program uh, for women and the women-led enterprises with combinations of uh, financial inclusion and uh, capacity buildings. So in terms of, com uh, in terms of uh, financial uh, inclusions, we plan to co cooperate with the CAPE uh, in establishing the credit enhancement scheme and uh, co-financing uh, uh, facilities for women that could easily to access the uh, uh, financial service uh, in the market. All the efforts we made are trying to shorten the funding gap for women and the women uh, enterprises to survive at this moment and also to enhance the economic empowerment for livelihood. So, so in terms of capacity buildings, the program aims to upgrade the uh, woman's job, job skill, by linking G with uh, local uh, vocational training centers in offering a various uh, 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 training courses, courses uh, for, for women, such as uh, 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 a uh, digital skill or uh, food and beverage, uh, be beverage or uh, be uh, beauty and body care, as well as some uh, micro trade skills. Of course, we, uh, we, we will also offer the local financial, some uh, uh, professional courses uh, to help the financial institution get familiar with uh, uh, FinTech and uh, financial inclusion, as well as uh, credit guarantees. Next, please. As I mentioned, this program is, is a holistic, and uh, it covers a various foreign aid resources together to cope with, uh, to cope with uh, uh, the issue of women empowerment. So we are actually uh, thinking for the external resources to get, uh, and engaging the like-minded friends, such as the international organization or regional uh, development uh, government, local uh, NGO to scale up the benefit of proposed uh, programs. So among of this, I think the CAPE has been well known um, regional banks in Central America. 
And uh, I think they have a real experiences on operation of a woman issues. Uh, I, I believe CAPE's participation will facilitate and enhance women's empo empo employ employment and uh, entrepreneurship uh, capabilities on inclusive and resilience basis in the post-COVID-19 era. Thank you for your listening. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Jonathan. Now we will have the opportunity to see and read a pre-recorded video from Mrs. Mayra Falk, president of the Honduran Bank for Production and Housing, Banprovi. This public bank is part of the network of, of financial institutions through which CABE channels resources for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Muy buenas. Desde Honduras, el corazón de América, les saluda Mayra Fal, presidenta del Banco Hondureño para la Producción y la Vivienda, Banprovi, con el objetivo de discutir en este magno evento un tema trascendental relacionado no solo al tema ambiental, sino también al tema de igualdad de oportunidades y derechos para las mujeres. Nos vamos a referir en esta ocasión a la importancia que tienen las mujeres en la reactivación de la economía, tanto durante la pandem pandemia como en la post-pandemia. Para ello abordaremos tres puntos. El primero de ellos es ¿por qué somos un banco comprometido con el desarrollo? ¿Por qué somos un banco que está trabajando la igualdad de oportunidades? En segundo lugar, ¿qué hemos hecho para promover el tema de la igualdad de oportunidades y derechos para las mujeres en el tema de políticas e institucionalidad, pero también en el tema de productos a la medida, como dardos que lleguen al corazón de las mujeres y que nos permitan atenderlas de acuerdo a sus necesidades. En tercer lugar, una nota final a manera de conclusión. Las políticas claves que ha implementado Banprovi se resumen de la manera siguiente. Hemos implementado la política de servicio de administración de riesgos ambientales y sociales por sus siglas en inglés SARAS, con el objetivo de lograr certificación para acceso a fondos verdes, pero también para ser una institución comprometida con el tema ambiental y social. Ejemplos de ellos son que pasamos a utilizar solo iluminación LED, reducimos el uso de papel, Estamos logrando tener más mujeres desde el consejo directivo hasta la base de la pirámide. Esto ha permitido que más del 45% de las personas que trabajamos en esta institución seamos mujeres. Pero en el cuerpo directivo de tres personas, dos son mujeres. Y en el cuerpo gerencial tenemos muchas mujeres participantes. La política de género se ha implementado con el objetivo de hacer una revisión hacia adentro, pero también con el objetivo de incluir mujeres empresarias como nuestras clientes. En tercer lugar, la política de lavado de activos y combate al terrorismo, con el fin de que este flagelo no contamine los fondos institucionales y que los donantes confíen en nosotros y que los financiadores internacionales confíen en nosotros, porque nosotros somos un banco limpio. Por el otro lado, la política de expansión de servicios, que más o menos se resume de la siguiente manera. En 2017 éramos un banco de segundo piso y un banco que administraba fideicomisos. En 2018 implementamos nuestra banca de primer piso para estar más cerca de las mujeres emprendedoras y empresarias. En 2019 implementamos una nueva estructura institucional y creamos la gerencia. Y en 2020, cuando la pandemia falló, cuando todo estaba complicado en el país, entonces implementamos los fondos de garantía y las transacciones electrónicas. ¿Por qué durante la pandemia el tema de igualdad se ha vuelto tan importante para un banco como el nuestro? 
un banco integral de desarrollo. En primer lugar, porque es una muy buena oportunidad para romper el círculo vicioso que existe en el lado del trabajo de las mujeres entre los cuidados, la desigualdad, la precariedad, la exclusión y la pobreza. Son cinco aspectos que generan un círculo vicioso que no permiten que las mujeres salgan de él. Y la única manera de lograr esa salida es con un financiamiento a la medida, con garantías a la medida y con transacciones electrónicas si los hogares están en condiciones de pobreza extrema. Por el otro lado, la recuperación posterior a la pandemia, aunque a muchos no les guste, va a tener rostro de mujer. Las mujeres lideran mejor las empresas y tienen mejor moral de pago. Entonces, ¿por qué no focalizar nuestras acciones en el tema de mujer? La banca de segundo piso financia 91 intermediarios financieros, de los cuales 13 son bancos. El resto son otro tipo de instituciones. Y ahí tenemos dos que son claves. Cajas rurales, donde siempre la tesorera es mujer. Y Junta de Agua, donde siempre la tesorera es mujer. Y esto nos permite entrar al tema social y ambiental. En banca de primer piso, hemos financiado mujeres muy en la base de la pirámide. Hay mujeres que han pedido 28 dólares y otras, bueno, han pedido hasta 740 mil dólares. Pero estamos hablando de inclusión viva, estamos hablando de que las mujeres están bancarizándose y estamos logrando con ello que poco a poco ganen confianza en sí mismas y con la compañía de garantías recíprocas puedan acceder al crédito. Para facilitar, hemos creado la garantía recíproca. Y el 57, 54% de las garantías son para mujeres. Y en transacciones electrónicas que van dirigidas en su mayoría a hogares pobres y a mujeres afectadas por los huracanes, el 87% de las transacciones son para mujeres. Estas son nuestras cifras. Estamos mejorando cada vez el alcance del financiamiento a las mujeres. Pero... Las cifras nos interesan a los técnicos, pero a la larga lo importante son los rostros de las mujeres. Veamos algunos de ellos. Sobey Gantino, a punto de quebrar durante la pandemia. Como en casa, una atención a la medida de los ordenos. Ahí se come lengua con aceitunas, lengua de vaca con aceitunas, todos los días del Señor como el plato emblemático que ella produce. Y la levantamos durante la pandemia. Tiene delivery y hace un despacho de más o menos 160 personas en su local ahorita a la hora del almuerzo, todo por turnos. Estamos hablando de una mujer de 41 años, líder de hogar. Victoria Dubón. Alquilaba y ahora tiene su casa. Es cierto, ella ya tiene su ingreso, pero estamos financiando felicidad a través de la vivienda. Nelly Perdomo es el rostro de una mujer joven, una capicultora de esta de cepa, de allá del occidente de Honduras, de las montañas tierra adentro. Ella, junto a su marido, producen cafés especiales y a través del financiamiento de Banprovi han logrado mejorar sus ingresos y la calidad de sus cafés. Tienen tres sellos especiales y están vendiendo sus cafés por lotes, lo cual implica mayor ingreso. Dalila Marariaga, una mujer joven de menos de 40 años, empleando mujeres para producir chile jalapeño, en estructuras protegidas para atacar los embates del cambio climático. Todo lo hizo durante la pandemia. Dalila trabajó incansablemente para acceder a un crédito en menos de 20 días con un banco. Y lo logró. Y está empleando mujeres y está saliendo adelante junto con su marido. Pero está liderando un emprendimiento familiar muy importante al cual se vinculan también sus hijos. Por el otro lado, Blanca Rodríguez, 
una mujer emprendedora en prenda de vestir. Blanca, madre sola, solicitó un crédito en primer piso, compró máquina y logró hacer esta blusa de botoncitos blancos y color rojo la Navidad anterior una tendencia en Tegucigalpa. Entonces, si podemos ver estos rostros de las mujeres que trabajando hombro a hombro con hombres logran realmente sacar a Honduras adelante a través de un financiamiento a través de Banprovi. En Banprovi hemos comprendido algo. Estamos esculpidos de la misma manera, mujeres y hombres. Estamos cortados con diferentes tijeras. Tenemos actuaciones diferentes. Estamos hechos de la misma manera. Somos hondureños. E igualmente indispensable. Esta sociedad no va a salir adelante si nosotros no aplanamos la cancha. La igualdad no se trata de discriminar. Se trata de aplanar la cancha y lograr que mujeres y hombres en este vaivén hagan que Honduras dé el salto cualitativo en el tema ambiental, en el tema social y en el tema económico, por supuesto. Y por eso financiar emprendimientos a la medida es una clave en la pandemia y en la pospandemia. Ustedes ven estos rostros de mujeres. Todos son rostros alegres, mujeres que trabajan, mujeres que entregan en el día a día su sudor para sacar adelante y no son un grupo vulnerable, yo por lo menos no la veo vulnerable, son actoras y autoras del desarrollo. Las mujeres dejamos de ser un grupo vulnerable para convertirnos en actoras y autoras del desarrollo. Y desde Banprovi ese lema nos permite financiar cada vez más mujeres que levantan. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video as I did. Very well done and very important. Now we have the pleasure of welcoming Mrs. Sofia Chen. Ms. Chen is the Chief Investment Officer of Katai Financial Holdings. She holds an MS in Finance Banking. Mr. Chen has 25 years of experience in research and investment with last position acting as a Chairman and Head of Research of Mary Lynch, Taiwan. In recent years, she has also been actively promoting corporate sustainability and, and social responsible, uh, I'm sorry, responsibility and, and social responsible investment in Taiwan. Sofia was appointed as chair of Asia Investor Group on Climate Change, AIGCC, in November 2018. Her presentation will be accelerating transformation with innovative, innovative financial mechanisms perspective from Taiwan. Thank you, Mrs. Chen, for your you. participation. Thank you, Julia, for your introduction. Hi. Um, today, in my, in my presentation, I will break down into a few sections. Next, please. I will make a brief introduction on who we are and the financial industry in Taiwan. And I will talk about how in Asia countries, whether there are good examples that we can leverage the financial industry in supporting emerging markets. And I'll talk about the SME in Taiwan, and then how Taiwan ICDF uh, contribute to the world, which Jonathan has mentioned, and how I reflect that, how we can do when we communicate with financial industry. Next, please. Next. Taiwan government is very supportive for sustainability and ESG investing. You can see to the right hand side, uh, the sustainable funds in Taiwan is growing very quickly. Next, please. Our group, Cathay Financial Holdings, is the largest group with total assets of around uh, over 300 billion US dollars. And you can see roughly 10 years ago, we have formed the Sustainability Committee. I have highlighted in blue, you can see how we are very active in participating in global initiative on climate change and responsible investment. We also started to engage on valuing water initiative in 2020, and this year, we involved in Asia Utility Engagement Program. Our group has committed to net zero by 
2050, also 100% renewable energy by 2030. Next, please. And for our bank, we have um, compared with what Jonathan has just mentioned and the bank chairman has explained, it was a lot of work that people have to spend the time. And as a, as a bank, when we are not very familiar with many emerging countries, we can collaborate with local partners. For example, in Cambodia, we work with many uh, microfinance companies. We link to them, we work with them to assist local micro business and individuals. Next page. And our group is very active in international collaboration, engagement, including uh, climate change actions, uh, low carbon investments, and we have been participating in investor agenda since 2014. Next, please. And we put a lot of effort on Taiwan listed companies pushing on their information disclosure. Without disclosure, there's nothing people can have the dialogue. We are also very active in climate-related action. Uh, we are the only Taiwan financial group who participates in Climate Action 100 Plus. We engage global high emitters asking for better climate governance framework. We also have a carbon disclosure project to encourage our investee and borrowers also to reply to CDB questionnaire. So far, our performance is one of the best in the world. Next, please. The, I, was, I was spend a few pages explaining about in emerging Asia, especially in Southeast Asia, how the microbe uh, business is developing. To the left hand side of the slides, you can see except Myanmar, which SME is not a very big portion, but it still actually is 90% of the economy. And where you can see most of the countries, more than 95% of their companies are SME companies. So naturally it's very important for the banking industry, if we can support micro SME, once they grow up, they can become even a more important role to the country. But to the right hand side, you can also see the micro SME by sectors. Uh, the blue bar is the wholesale and retail business, basically are the small shops. And then the orange bar is the manufacturing. So you can see for different countries, there are some are bigger, some are smaller in manufacturing, which can become a bigger company. That's how Taiwan started 60 years ago. The next page. And but if we look at how important these SME companies are and how much the financial industry has supported them, you can see that uh, SME, the, the, the loan to GDP is about 15%, and the loans to total bank loan is about 17%. But if you look to the right hand side, you can see the com compound growth is very flat. There's no growth at all. And as a result, you can see to the lower part, the uh, SME are going to the non-bank financial institution, financing company, microfinance companies. You can see the compound growth to the right hand side. It's very quickly. It's about 13% compound growth in the past 10 years. The next page. And so I put the chart, you can easy, uh, easily visualize. The left hand side upper corner is the SME loan to uh, the GDP, where to the right hand side is the micro SME loan to the bank total loan. And you can see the data, for example, Laos is very uh, late in, in a development where in Thailand, you can see the green lines developing very fast, stay stable roughly 30%, 35% of bank loan. But what's important is to the left hand side bottom, you can see the blue dot is the banking industry over NPOs. But the, the, the green dot, the blue bar is the loan, the bad debt ratio to micro SME. It's much higher. So if you lend to SME, it becomes uh, more risky. Then the banks will become reluctant. So can we find an innovative way to solve the problem will be very critical to further growth for SME loans. And to the right hand side, you can see the SME loan, uh, the NPO ratio is relatively high for many countries. The next page. Um, so for, for this emerging market in Southeast Asia and also other emerging countries, I have put a few ideas on some of the NGOs, some of the financial innovation. What do they do in this country? This is a project called Room to Read. And they send books to many countries in Southeast Asia, including Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam. And I donate to one of the, uh, the schools in Cambodia. 
and because without education, there's no hope for them to turn around. So uh, this room to reorganization is very well, well recognized in the world. And you can see how big is the influence they have so far. The next page, you can see the number of people. They also help the girls to go to school. They also try to teach the teachers so they can have better education capability. You can see so far, they have uh, benefit more than 30,000 uh, girls to school. And they can they also have helped many uh, schools and students. You can see the very left hand side, you can see more than uh, 18 million uh, kids already. And very exciting, you can see already 76,000 people going to uh, the secondary school. It's very positive. The next page. This is a uh, next page, please. And I think uh, Eunice. Uh, Professor Yunus' organization is very well known by the world. Over the year, when they lend to this uh, micro SME, the family, a little business, they start to incorporate banking's help. They work with UBS, so you can see that's a very good cycle. If the SME prove they can really become a successful model, they could get a receive further grants from uh, the collaboration fund by UBS and by uh, UNAS organization. So this become an incentive. When you receive the fund, you want to do even further better job. The next page. So you can see so far on this program, they have launched, they already grant roughly 5 million US dollars of loan, and this is growing. So you can see to the right hand side, they have um, 32 so social business inactive portfolio. There's a lot of statistics that you can see on their web page. Uh, and the next page. So you can see uh, the countries that benefit, including Brazil, Cambodia, India, Kenya, Uganda. You can see all the penetration. I believe this model can become a sample for many other emerging markets. The next page. Um, this is a company which come from uh, Japan, young gentleman. It's called Gojo. They have go to many uh, countries already in, I think it's only about five years. You can see in India, in Myanmar, in Sri Lanka, in uh, Turkestan, in Cambodia. They are going to Africa very soon. They, they find this micro SME, but they are like the middle intermediate. They go for a uh, lender to them and they go investor, invest in this company, so they can borrow the fund and they can lend out, or eventually they can also invest to the company. So I've put the, in the blue, you can see the business they provide, including micro credit, micro savings, affordable housing loan, uh, micro SME supply chain finance. As uh, Jonathan mentioned, if you help this SME, and they need the finance. So this is another sample that's worth exploring. And the business is growing very well, and they are attracting very good investors to invest in this company so they can provide funding to micro SME. The next page, you can see how they do the process. Next page, please. Yeah, so, so far, they have already granted a lot of loans, um, more, more than 800,000 customers already. And that ninety eight percent of their borrowers are actually female, so this captured very well with uh, today's topic. The next page, and this is another one uh, besides lending. This is a, a social return on investment analysis. This is is launched by a Singapore asset manager called Impact Investment Exchange. They have launched already very quickly the fourth uh, women's livelihood bond, and you can see they they work many on female, and also who, who, who female who suffer from climate change, uh, environmental change. And so you can see the, the total amount, also green bond as well. The next page. So far, they have helped in many countries, as you can see. And, and, and most of that is in Southeast Asia. And they already launched the fourth fund. You can see from the pink number, very small and growing. So they start with a small ticket. And once you see the track record, you are happy to give them a bigger ticket. Mm -hmm. the, the fourth bond is already more than about more than 30 million US dollars. So I, I believe they will become bigger very soon. The next page. How about Taiwan SME? Um, next page. 
Taiwan started its SME business about five, 56 years already. So today, we're very lucky. Taiwan SME is more than 90% of the companies, and they contribute about 30% of our economy and, and the, the revenue. And the next page. And we already have about 25% of the banking system linked into SME. Uh, most of the SME, because Taiwan have a lot of liquidity, Taiwan SME doesn't need the similar uh, help as Jonathan, um, um, the, the lady just mentioned. Uh, and so we are quite well established. And Taiwan also from a, a health taker become a health giver. Uh, next page. And that's why you can see as a uh, next page. ICDF explained that the area of their focus. And I was very impressed by how much our ICDF has um, helped in the world. If you see the next page on their global map, they have almost so many area. The more rural area, the more help ICDF goes. The next page, you can see the project they have helped, uh, including uh, agriculture, public health, and the triangle is education. The water dot is environment. They've done so many projects in so many different countries, but many of them are actually not in the banking list. The banks don't even lend to them these countries. So. I keep thinking about how to connect the development fund with the regular commercial banking system. The next page. So um, ICDF has worked with 24 countries and with CAPE. In the next page, you can see this is the main area. Uh, a lot of for financial, for micro SME, uh, public sector operations, and environment, you can see uh, forest, uh, capability enhancement, and also the economy. Uh, projects. The next page. And so today, ICDA from decades ago is more mainly helping on agriculture farmers. But in the next page, you can see uh, ICDA project already expand to many, many areas. And what's very uh, touched is that last year in COVID area, co and when the COVID-19, they spent a lot of time on women, also on online training education. So uh, the, the uh, young people's their education will not be disrupted. And the next page, they also leverage their technology in different areas. You can see infrastructure, green infrastructure, and renewable energy and climate actions. Now, these are very impressive. But how do we link this with financial industry? And so um, the next page. Um, today in Asia, there are already 12 countries. They commit to net zero. And some of them are very quickly announced in the past two months. Previously, it was only about eight countries. So there's a very fast global trend on how to tackle climate change, how to make sure micro SME, women, and disadvantaged countries are less affected, or can they be better supported? I have summarized in the next page how financial industry, um, the opportunities when they see. If you can just run through for me uh, one by one. First of all, many financial institutions, they think this is very good. They used to work with like Asia Development Bank, uh, EDRB. Some banks are very interested in investing in the bonds. And they were happy to lend if someone locally can help them to manage the pro pro project and make sure the quality. And some banks think, well, we can discuss case by case. So if you have someone who help you to design the case mm -hmm. well, make it become bankable, investable, I think bank will be willing to review and to help. And some insurance companies are very interested in investing in social impact bonds. And some banks are interested in exploring solutions. Can ICDF help me so I don't have to go to so many countries by myself? But on the other hand, what are the challenges, the concerns banks have? And in the next page, you can see that the banks has also highlighted the problem. How about um, the non-performing loans? How about the asset quality? Uh, and ma many of them are not familiar with enough organizations. So I think maybe with ICDF help, the banks can also know more global NGO and global development funds. So they can really know what are the needs in different countries. You can also see that banks are too busy to handle this small amount of loan, so they need someone to do post-lending activities for them. And some banks, they just cannot lend more than seven years or 10 years. So we need to design a long-term uh, uh, syndication project finance loan into a series of loans, which provides better, shorter uh, duration. 
Yeah, and then some banks, they will think that, oh, how about uh, emerging markets? I need to do KYC, know your clients. I need to make sure there's no mon money laundering. H can you have an uh, infrastructure helping me to prevent those problems? So a proper governance, a, a, a company with very good corporate governance were definitely in the first priority for when financial institution consider investment or lending. So these are some of the concerns I see. Next page. Uh, if you can just throw over. So I, I think it will be very, very worthwhile to start with a pilot project somewhere in, in Central America, in Southeast Asia, that's all fine. Start with a project with a team, a company or a project who has good corporate governance and we can help them to shape their business, make it become scalable in the future and you will become bankable and investable very soon. And then if we can try to make this uh, potential bonds or loans into shorter dis duration, they will be very, very useful. And I think in early stage, the, the financial institution, as long as they are not familiar, they still need in early stage the guarantee. And over time, once they build the experience, they will be happy to take more risk over the time. So I think we should start a pilot program and we can let the track record speak itself so people have don't have to discuss, oh, I'm concerned about the asset quality. So when, when Jonathan mentioned, and uh, Mr. Chi also mentioned, in SDGs, we should not leave anyone behind. But the way we think about banking and the way we think about investment in the past 100 years, we, leave, we are leaving too many people behind. If a country with very poor credit rating, any company from the, comp the country they don't even have a chance to be evaluated. So we need to think about, if I don't give money at this, can I give time, effort, expertise, helping those companies to become bankable, investable to start with. So um, today when we, uh, if you can roll to the next page. Today when we talk about a big country or a very good company, we often define them as a GDP or of a company is how much money they make. And I truly hope in the future, mm. we are talking about a good country and a good company, but how they lead the world to a common prosperity, to a low carbon economy, and also can help as much to the emerging countries to ma make them bankable, investable, and provide them more funding. So all the women, all the disadvantaged families, they can have a future. Next page. So this is my presentation. I hope it's useful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chen, for this illustrative presentation. To conclude mm -hmm. this portion of the event, we have the participation of Mr. Miguel Angel Mendez, who heads the Department of Strategic Alliances and International Cooperation of CABEI. Mr. Mendez holds uh, an MS in Business Administration. His experience includes international development work in technical fields. He also has extensive experience in structuring, financing, and implementing development and climate change programs and projects in Latin America and Asia. Thanks, Mr. Mendez, for your participation. <coughs> Thank you, Julio, and uh, nice to be here with you, uh, with all of you. And good afternoon, good morning to everyone uh, who is. Uh, uh, watching this, uh, this presentation. So uh, just to start, I, I, I would like to um, highlight the importance of the relationship between uh, Taiwan, uh, the Republic of China, Taiwan, and uh, the Central American Bank for Economic Integration. And in that regard, it's important to mention that the relationship with Taiwan and Kabe started many 